let's begin today. So we're going to continue talking about federalism. Yesterday we talked about two cases that redefine the relationship between the state and the national government. Federalism is actually something very unique to the United States. There's only a few countries, a handful of countries around the world that uses this system of government. Most countries around the world have what we call a unitary government, where most of the power and important authorities is delegated to one central national government. In the United States, that's not the case. We give important powers to both the national and the state governments, federalism in a nutshell. Now, there are advantages to that, and there's also disadvantages to that. One advantage of having federalism is the fact that today we have two different governments that can respond to different issues and different problems. We have a national government that's able to respond to national interests and national concerns. But we also have state governments that can respond to local interests and local concerns. They have their own power. So Texas, if we have a problem that's unique here to, the, to, the, to our state, we don't have to wait for daddy. We don't have to wait for the national government to respond to the problem. We can do it on our own because the Texas government has its own authorities, it has its own powers as well. So national issues can be addressed by the national government while local issues can be addressed by the state government. There's a delineation of responsibilities. Next, this is gonna be in your exam today. Write down concurrent policy areas. There are powers, there are authorities, there are policy areas that both governments can have authority over, that can, they can both exercise authority over. And the beauty of that is, is, as a person, if you're concerned about those policy areas, you can try to influence one or both of the governments to get what you want. So for example, one of the concurrent authorities that both the national and state governments have uh, is taxes. Let's say you're somebody in the United States that's very concerned about taxes. You want to lower taxes. Well, there's good news for you, right? You can try to influence the U.S. government and get federal taxes lower, or you can try to influence the Texas government to get tax state taxes lower. But the point is, you have multiple access points to get what you want. Just because you fail with, in the U.S. government, it doesn't mean that you fail forever. You can try to influence your state as well. What's another concurrent power that they both share? They can both build what? Infrastructure. Infrastructure, like roads, for example. Let's say you're somebody who's concerned about roads. Maybe you think we don't have enough of it. Well, you have two different avenues, two different ways in which you can get what you want. You can try to influence the US government. If they don't, they don't listen to you, that's OK. You can also influence the state government as well, because both of them share that power. Both of them can influence that policy area. That's on your exam, so make sure you remember that. All right, another advantage of federalism is the fact that we can test out policies before adopting it for the entire country. So what often happens is, when there's a new idea that's being proposed, what happens oftentimes in the United States is, individual states try it out first, and then we wait years later to see its effect, whether or not it's positive or negative. If it has good effects, if it has good impact, then the national government will borrow that idea and adopt it as policy for the entire country. Um, this is the case, for example, for the eight-hour workday. First, we tried it out in some states first, and then when we saw that it was working out, the U.S. government adopted it for the United States. It's the same thing with same-sex marriage. Some states tried it out first, Forced same sex marriage was legal everywhere in the United States. We tried it out in some states, and then the U.S. government eventually adopted it. The point is, we can experiment with policies. Because each state can make their own decisions. We can try out a policy in these states first, and then try it out at the national level. Other countries don't have this luxury. They either try it or they don't, because they have one government making decisions. Right now, there are many experiments going on about policies. Like for example, an $11 minimum wage. Right now, that's being tried in California. That's being tried in Washington, D.C. Years later, we'll see the kind of effects that it will have in those states, and then maybe the U.S. government will decide to adopt it for everybody. Right now, marijuana legalization is being tried out in several states in the United States, in Colorado, in California. The U.S. government someday may choose to adopt it for all 50 states. 
Does that make sense? We have the luxury of experimentation because of federalism. We can try out policies at the local level first and then adopt it to the national level later on. That's why states are known as the laboratories of democracy. Any questions about that, guys? Despite all of this, there are very profound negatives and disadvantages of federalism that some countries do not have to deal with. Number one, policy making is a lot harder because of federalism. Sometimes the national government wants to do something, but it needs to get the states on board in order to do it. Like for example, U.S. versus Lopez. For most of you, you probably think that the U.S. government was trying or attempting to do a good thing. Try to stop gun violence in schools. But because of federalism, they weren't allowed to do it because they have to share powers with the state governments as well. So right now, today, there are things that the national government wants to accomplish, but it's unable to do so because it doesn't have all of authority, all, all the authority. They have to share it with the state and local governments. This is something that we saw evident during the pandemic. The pandemic still going on, but during the, when it was at its height in 2020 and 2021, the U.S. government wanted to attack the pandemic one way, but you've got some states that disagree. You've got some states that want to tackle it another way. That doesn't work. When it comes to a national crisis like that, you need to have one plan of attack. But since we have federalism in the United States, some states disobeyed the U.S. government and the U.S. government's policies, and we didn't have one coherent plan of attack. Other countries dealt with the pandemic a lot better than we did. Why? Because most countries have a unitary government. They have one government making one policy for everybody. Does that make sense for everybody? Any questions so far? So the pandemic in the United States probably lasted a lot longer than it should have been if we didn't have federalism in the United States. Number two, different qualities of services, government services and benefits. Different qualities of government services and benefits. Because a lot of these services and benefits are being provided by each individual state, they're going to be of different quality. Some are going to do it better, some are going to do it worse. We talked about education in this class before. Some states spend more money on education, some states spend less money on education. So some students are getting a lower quality of education just for the simple fact that they live in a state that doesn't want to spend money on them. Some states have a higher quality of education because their governments make better policy in regards to education. We talked about welfare, and that's mostly the responsibility of state governments today. So today, some people in need are not getting as much as they need from their governments because their state governments choose not to be stingy with the benefits that they provide. Some states, they give too much. Any questions, guys? Probably the worst thing about federalism, and this is not, this is something that I've always told you about, the U.S. Constitution is not very clear on who's supposed to be doing what whose responsibility, even education, for example, the Supreme Court, I mean, sorry, the Constitution of the United States doesn't mention anything about education. We just assume that it's mostly the responsibility of the states. But today, because of that vagueness, there's a lot of debates. Republicans and Democrats are at each other's throats. Part of the reason why is this. Because some say this should be the state's responsibility, or some say it should be the national government's responsibility. They cause a lot of division in the United States. Now, there's a good thing about it. There's some flexibility about federalism in the United States because those powers, like I said, are not clearly defined. Sometimes when the states need help, the federal government can intervene and help, like in education, for example. There's room to be flexible. But there's also room for a lot of arguments, a lot of division in the United States because, again, those powers are not clearly defined. Any questions? All right. Let's move on to your review. Go ahead and take out that review that you picked up today. These are disclaimer. You are reviewing today, but I will not be able to go over everything. It is your responsibility to do this. You should have been doing this last night. I'm going to do this to, to today, tonight, and hopefully tomorrow night as well. That's is on Friday. All right, if there's a number in here, that you're not sure about, let me know, please, okay? Number one, again, I'm not gonna go over everything that you need. 
I can only go over so much because we're time constraints. Number one, government is any institution that makes decisions for society as a whole. Any institution that makes decisions for society as a whole. It could be the national government, it could be the state governments, it could be the local governments. Decisions for society as a whole. This is all on your notes if you're planning to study your notes anyway. And don't worry about writing this down. Those decisions are called policy. So any decision that a government makes is called policy. Anything that has to do with government and policy is politics. Anything that has to do with government politi and policy is politics. Particularly, the debate between the Republicans and Democrats is something that is called politics as well. Number two, does everyone know the difference between a direct democracy and a Republican representative democracy? Does everybody know it? Can I move on? I'm good? If not, let me know. Direct democracies, people themselves make the policy. In a Republican democracy, who makes the policies? Representatives of people elected. Well educated representatives. I'm good. Number three, I'm going to go over really quickly. Again, this is just like glancing over. It's up to you to fill in the details. These are the three theories of democracy. You should be able to know the following things about each one of these three theories. Participatory democracy, broad participation or limited participation by people. Broad, broad which means everyone can participate. Broad in the form of what? Groups. Individuals. Oh, Individuals, people, citizens, individual citizens. Pluralism, broad or limited participation? Broad. Broad, the form of? Groups. Groups. Elite, broad or limited? Limited. Limited. Limited to whom? Elites. Wealthy, Small educated, the elites. Very good. What's the advantage of participatory democracy where all individuals have an influence over their government officials? The decisions that are being made will reflect the will of the people. That's the advantage. So in participatory democracy, where each person has influence over their government, government will make decisions, will make policies that would reflect the people's will. Make sense? Anyone confused? What's the advantage of pluralism, the main advantage of pluralism? What did Madison say in Federalist Number 10? That minorities are going to get stepped up by the majority. Why does he want all groups to exist and be able to influence the government? Because what will these groups do? They will uh, compete against each they other. They will compete. They will argue against one another. They will debate each other, preventing one from becoming too powerful. So the advantage of pluralism is groups will inevitably debate, compete, counterbalance each other, preventing one from becoming too powerful. Now that's in Plan 10, by the way. That's why Madison says large republics are better, because there are more groups, which means there are more debate or more counterbalancing each other. What's the advantage of elite democracy? If only a few people are able to influence government, decisions are more important. Government is going to be able to make better policies, or more informed policies, better policies. At the cost of them largely benefiting the elites themselves. Very well. Let's talk about disadvantages. The disadvantage of participatory democracy is who always gets what they want. The majority. The majority. Unchecked majority. And if what they want is people's rights and people's property, they'll be able to take it. But the disadvantage of pluralism, sometimes government, there's one or two consequences of pluralism. Government is reluctant to make policy because it's, it doesn't want to offend any of these groups trying to influence it. So government doesn't make policy. Or government is reluctant to make policy. And that's one does, option. If it does make a policy, it can be largely effective. So again, first consequence, negative consequence of pluralism is government is reluctant to make policy because it doesn't want to offend the groups that's influencing it. It's right. The second option, like he said over there, um, is that government does make policy, but it attempts to please everybody, so it's an ineffective policy. Alright. <coughs> Lastly, Policy in an elite democracy reflects the will of a few instead of the will of the people. And sometimes that means serving the interests of the elite rather than serving the interests of the common good. 
What I really want you to remember, if that's going to be in this is going to be in your exam, is how these theories of democracy is evident. Are, how are they evident today? What are the evidences that we may have participatory or pluralism? Let's talk about participatory first. Um, the fact that today a lot of our the people that work in government are what is an evidence in, is evidence of participatory democracy. Your senators, your House of Representative members, the people in state of state government in Austin, all of these people are what? Elected. They're elected. When you cast your vote, you're one person influencing your government. So elected government officials is an evidence of participatory democracy. All right, give me evidence of pluralism, the fact that what kind of groups exist today in the United States? Political parties. Political parties would be one, and interest groups would be another. We have thousands and thousands of interest groups today all hoping to influence the government. We have two major political parties that often get what they want, and minor political parties as well. Any questions about that? Evidence of elite democracy in the United States. Well, look at your branches of government. Look at the executive. Are you able to directly influence who's going to be the president of the United States? No. Who does that? Well, the Electoral College. Right? Usually wealthy people are the Electoral College. How about judges and justices? Do you elect the national judges and justices? No. No. They're chosen by whom? The president. By the president of the United States. If you're looking for participatory democracy, there's only one branch of government where you can actually find it, and that would be the legislative, legislative branch. Even the Senate, way back then, wasn't very democratic because they were chosen by state governments instead of being elected by the people. We had to change the Constitution in order to make it more democratic. Any questions, guys? All right. I need you to know these ideas that we took from the Enlightenment. You need to be able to describe what they are. And most importantly, you need to be able to know how they are evident in our founding documents, particularly the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. So when you're studying tonight, there are there's a section about the Declaration of Independence and there's a section about the U.S. Constitution where I give you excerpts from these documents and we underline and highlight things and say, hey, that's popular, that's popular sovereignty, that's social contract theory. To know, you need to be able to identify what kind of ideas are being evoked by some passages in the Declaration of Independence and in the U.S. Constitution. I'm not going to be able to go over that today. That's your job. Any questions, guys? Over here, these two bullets are going to be in your exam. The fact that today presidents can be impeached for doing things that are illegal, which of these ideas of democracy is being reflected in that fact? government, that our government is not boundless, it has restrictions, and if, if, if it crosses those restrictions, there's going to be accountability. You can also put checks and balances on here. They're not going to try to trick you and put limited government and checks and balances. That's your answer choices. So limited government, checks and balances, that's what being evoked there. How about this? The Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution. Which of these ideas are from the Enlightenment? Natural rights. Natural rights. That there are some rights, some liberties that are so important, so fundamental for humanity that they need to be protected from our very own government. Natural rights are rights that you have because you're a human. Um, social contract is the agreement that we make with government to surrender some of our freedoms in exchange for the protection of our life, our liberty, and our property. Any questions so far? All right, this is a whole lot of questions on the multiple choice section. You need to know the difference between the types of government that these two constitutions establish. A system of government the Articles of Confederation established is exactly what it says, a confederacy. A confederation. A confederacy is when the state governments are the ones with the power, most of the important responsibilities, while there's a weak national government in the center. So powerful states, very weak national government. That's what a confederacy is. That's not what we have anymore in the United States Constitution today. Today, what's the balance of power like? 
the central government is more powerful than the states around it. Yes. It's federal. But what do we do with power? We give federal. some to the states, we give some to the national government. What do we call that? The federal. Federalism. We have a federal system of government. Very good. How many branches of government did, they, did we used to have under the articles? One. 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 A what? A legislative branch. Today, how many branches of government do we have? Three. Three. National. I mean, the national government has the executive, legislative, and judicial. All right. Answer this question for me. This one branch, Congress, a legislative branch, that the articles have, how many houses or chambers did it have? One. 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 Today, how many houses of Congress do we have? Two. 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 We would call that? One. 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 Bicameral legislature. Yes. The House and the Senate. It's called a bicameral legislature. Two houses. Let's talk about representation. In this one house of, uh, of Congress, in this one branch of government, how many representatives can each state elect? One, one representative each. One representative each. So when they're deciding whether or not a law is a good idea or a bad idea, each state gets one person in there and one vote. Is that the case today? No. No. Today, we have two houses of government, bicameral legislature. House representation like in the Senate, it's what? In the U.S. Senate, representation for each state is what? Static. Static, better word. has how many representatives in the Senate? Two. 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 Two for each day. In the House of Representatives, representation is what? Depending Based on population. Based on population. Very good. In the House of Representatives, population matters. Make sense? What agreement did our founding fathers settle with that created such a Congress? The Great Compromise? The Great Compromise. The Great Compromise. Alright, let's talk about taxation. Under the Articles of Federation, who had the power to tax? State, federal, or both? Only states. State, only states. How about today, under the U.S. Constitution? State, federal, or both? Both. Both. What do we call that kind of power? If both of them can that influence that policy area, that's called a what kind of power? Powers that they can both have, that they both affect. Concurrent power. Concurrent. Call it concurrent power. Next, economic powers. Powers that affect the economy, like being able to coin money, being able to impose foreign tariffs, controlling international trade and in interstate trade. Who did that belong to under the article? State, federal, or both? State only. Today, who has that power? Only the national government. So the one thing I need, remember, I'll give you a freebie on your exam. In the U.S. Constitution, the national government is a lot more powerful when it comes to economic powers. It has gained a lot of economic authority. All of this now belongs exclusively to the U.S. government. All right, any questions so far? Who was in charge, or who was mostly responsible for national defense? State, federal, or both? The states and states. So the national government couldn't afford an army, so the states had to be responsible for their own defense. Today, under the U.S. Constitution, who is responsible for national defense? State, federal, or both? Federal, but only the federal. with this on your homework assignment, when I mention national policy making, I'm referring to how does Congress make laws? How do they pass laws? In the Articles of Confederation, this Congress right here, how can laws pass? Nine out of the 13 representatives that are part of Congress have to agree. Today, our Congress, made up of two houses, how can laws pass? Alright, it's something that we're going to talk about more in depth later on. But today, 
you need just a simple majority of both houses of Congress. A simple majority of both houses. Which means a little more than what? Half. A little more than half. Those of you who are good at math, what does that mean in terms of the Senate? How many senators have to vote yes in order for a law to pass in the Senate? All right, if there's two senators in each state, there's 100 senators, 51. Very good. In the House of Representatives, there's a total of 435 representatives in there. Do the math. It's a little bit more than half of 435. You're close. 218. 218 yes votes is required in the House of Representatives. But the point is, it's easier today because it's a simple majority of both houses of Congress. Any questions? Now look at the last one, the amendment process. This refers to how to change the what? The Constitution. How do they change the Articles? Or how to change the U.S. Constitution? And then therefore, how to change the government that it established. So back then, in order to change the Articles of Confederation, what was required? 13 out of 13, 13, out of 13 state governments. Today, process is still difficult, but it's a lot easier than it used to be under the articles. There's two steps, proposal and ratification. I'm not going to go over all of this right now. Two, who can propose, two-thirds of Congress, or two-thirds of the states. Who can ratify, three-fourths of the states, either the state legislatures or three-fourths of the state conventions. By the time you walk in here on, on Friday, you better know the amendment process. If you don't, you're going to miss a lot of questions. In other words, Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution. Make sure you know Article 5, the amendment process, how to add amendments. When you walk in here on Friday, if there's a question in there, how do we add the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, you better know how it needs to be done. Any questions, guys? All right, what were the problems caused by the Articles? Again, we couldn't pay our debts, we couldn't provide for an army, no president that would enforce national laws, no judicial branch that would settle disputes between states, all of that should be on your notes. But this one is on your test for sure. What are the problems exposed by Shays Rebellion? The number one problem that was exposed by Shays Rebellion is we lack the what? Army. An army, a centralized military. We lack a national military. Another problem is we couldn't pay off our debts, we couldn't provide services because our government couldn't tax, our national government was unable to tax. Any questions so far? All right, look at number eight. Know the type of men that participated in the Philadelphia or Constitutional Convention, the people that wrote our Constitution. Are they ordinary men? No. No. By the way, they're all men. Society, some of them are even slave owners. These are the people that wrote their constitution and created the government that we have now. That's why initially there's going to be problems with the, with the U.S. Constitution. Some say there's still problems with it today. No one was primarily responsible out of those 55 people, which one was primarily responsible for writing down the U.S. Constitution? James Madison. And with a lot of contributions from Alexander Hamilton as well. Any questions about that? All right. Know the compromises, the Great Compromise, the Three Fifths Compromise, the compromise about in the international slave trade, and compromise about tariffs and exports. All right. So with these bullets, you need to know two things. Number one. What's the argument about? What are they arguing about? And number two, how did they settle those arguments? I'm good. Look at them. Any of these not ringing a bell? All good. All right. There's a question about three fifths compromise on your exam. We're going to ask. Because of the Three-Fifths Compromise, what happened to the representation of slave-owning states? Did they get more representatives or did they get less representatives? More, 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 right? 
because what counts is part of a population now. The slaves. slaves. They don't count as a one person, they count as two fifths of a person. Representation in which house did it increase? The Senate or the House of Representatives? House of Representatives. I guarantee you they're going to try to trick you. One of the answer choices is going to say, uh, slave owning states' representation will increase in the U.S. Senate. That's wrong. In the U.S. Senate, everybody's what? It doesn't matter how many slaves you have, you get two. So don't get tricked. I'm good. Anyone have any questions so far? All right. Know how the following institutions of the national government reflect elite democracy. This one's simple, guys. The national government has three branches again, executive. Legislative and judicial. Do you directly select who's going to be the next president of the United States? No. Who does that? Electoral College. Judges and justices of the judicial branch. Are they elected by the American public? No. They're chosen by whom? By the president. If you're Joe Biden right now, what are you wishing for in regards to the judicial branch? That some of these judges and justices would just die off. <laughs> die already. So that when they die off, you can replace them with people that you pick yourself, especially those nine justices in the Supreme Court. All right, so elite democracy there, right? Let's look at the legislative branch. We got the Senate and we got the House. Which one represents elite democracy? Back then, anyway. The Senate, because senators back then were not elected directly by the American public. They were chosen by their state governments instead. Until we change the Constitution with the 17th Amendment, today we directly elect our senators, but it, it didn't used to be that way. If you're looking for democracy, if you're looking for participatory democracy, where do you find it in our U.S. government? The House of Representatives. The legislative branch, but specifically the House of Representatives, because from the very beginning, we've been allowed to directly select the people that will represent us the House of Representatives. Any questions? That's the answer to number 11 right there. House of Representative members, from the very beginning, it didn't take an amendment to do it. We've been allowed to directly elect them. All right, is everyone good with these mechanisms that decentralizes power? Federalism, state, and national, right? What separation of powers? branches of government, right? Subdivision. Then you got checks and balances. Each branch can check the other. Don't go with that. All right. Because of these three mechanisms, guys, look at the bolded question right here. Is policy making easier or harder? Harder. It's a lot harder. In the United States, making policy is hard. Powers are separated, we have federalism, there's checks and balances. Just because the president wants to accomplish something, he doesn't mean as he's going to be able to get it. He has to deal with the environment of checks and balances. But our founding fathers wanted it to be that way. They didn't want the country to change drastically very easily. They want change to be made, but they want change to be slow and deliberate. They want policy making to be competitive so that each branch can check each other. Any questions so far? Also, when it comes to the people in government, are they held more accountable or less accountable because of these mechanisms in the Constitution? They held more accountable. More accountable. If I was the President of the United States, I know. I'm looking over my shoulder, looking over the Congress, I'm looking over the judicial branch. If I misbehave, there are ways that they can hold me accountable because of checks and balances. Sense? Anyone confused? All right. You need to know the seven parts of the U.S. Constitution. There are seven articles to the U.S. Constitution. You need to know what each one is about. This one is very simple. Don't get scared. Articles one, two, and three. What are they about? The branches of the U.S. government. The branches of the U.S. government. Article one is about Congress, the legislative branch. Article two is about the presidency, the executive branch. And article three is about the courts, the judicial branch. Legislative, executive, and judicial in Articles 1, 2, and 3. Article 4, ignore. Don't waste brain power in Article 4. Article 5, you need to know by heart. Article 5 is how to do what to the Constitution. 
change it, how to change it, how to add things to the U.S. Constitution. We need to know the steps. We need to know how we can accomplish each step. That's two questions on a multiple choice right there that you're going to miss if you don't know what Article 5 is about. Questions about that? Article 6 to the U.S. Constitution is very easy. SSS 6. What's in, the, what's in Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution? SSS. What important clause. Oh, supremacy clause. Supremacy clause in Article 6. That's all I want you to remember for Article 6. The supremacy clause. It's a little sentence in the Constitution that tells us that national authority is supreme over state authority. Going good? All right. Here's a question you all need to know in your heads, right? Our founding fathers gave us Article 5. They gave us a way to fix things that are not right with the U.S. Constitution, to allow the U.S. Constitution and our government to change as our country changes. Like, for example, when we got rid of slavery, the 13th Amendment, when we gave women the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, they gave us a way to change our government. But this is a very difficult way. It requires super majorities, two-thirds and three-fourths, right? Why is it so difficult? Why did they make it purposely difficult? Here's why. The U.S. Constitution guarantees liberties and freedoms. If it was easy to change the U.S. Constitution, what does it mean for these liberties and freedoms? They can be easily taken, they can be easily taken away. That's why they made the amendment process purposely difficult. Does that make sense? Anyone confused by that? Know the arguments the anti-federalists had about the U.S. Constitution. Here's something that I can't do today. Not going to be able to go over these documents. But luckily for you, there you have them in your notes. And those videos that I posted on the, that playlist that talks about each one specifically. Um, all right. Favorite question on the AP exam regarding Brutus number one. Anti-federalists or federalists? Okay. Anti. So did it support or did it oppose the Constitution? Oh, Opposed the Constitution in Madison. The favorite question on your um, AP exam usually is, of course, somebody like Brutus is, doesn't like the U.S. Constitution, right? But specifically, what parts of the U.S. Constitution would he hate the most, and which parts would he probably be all right with? So I'll give you some things. The necessary and proper clause. Somebody like Brutus would he be all right with it, or would he not like that part? He wouldn't like it. Nobody like Buddha's prefers powers to be given to the states rather than the national government. What does the necessary and proper clause allow the national government to do? Over each of have power that are not clearly stated in the U.S. Constitution. To have more power. Somebody like Buddha's would want the power of the national government to be clearly defined, to be limited. But what the necessary and proper clause does is it allows the U.S. government to go beyond what the Constitution does that make sense? Next, supremacy clause. Would he be all right with that clause, or would he not like that clause? He would hate that clause because it tells us whose authority is supreme over whom. National is supreme over state, or he would rather it be the other way around. Anyone have any questions on that? All right, which about Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, the amendment process? All right with it? Not okay with it. Will be okay with it. Why? Because who's heavily involved? The state, the state governments are heavily involved. Very good. All right. Fed ten guys. I keep telling you this, and you guys keep forgetting. James Madison is telling us that the best way to control factions, Federalist Number Ten, is with a large republic. That's what Fed ten is about. Why his constitution? that establishes a stronger national government, a large republic, is better than the Articles of Confederation. How does a large republic control factions? That's what Fed 10 is about. In Fed 10, he makes two arguments. One, he, de he defends a republican system versus a direct democracy. And he likes republics better because he thinks republics are better going to protect people's rights, they're going to better control the majority. Then, once he establishes that republics are better, he makes an argument for what kind of a republic? Large. Large one versus a small one. So he makes two arguments, 
Know the arguments, please. A lot of you in your homework assignment having trouble with this. If you are still having trouble, let me know tomorrow morning. I'll be here tomorrow morning. All right, Fed 51, we've already gone over. Fed 51 is all about how the Constitution takes power and does what with it? Decentralize it, subdivide it with the following mechanisms, federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances, bicameralism, all of that serves to make sure not one person, not one group of people have too much of this authority. Decentralize it. Any questions? This one is the easiest one. This one you really, really need to study. All right, somebody answer 16 for me, please. Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights of the Constitution. All right, guys, we'll cover the rest tomorrow. <coughs> you were not here yesterday. Tomorrow, I'm going to be presenting this paper, not for a grade. <coughs> Whatever you write down on this paper, you may use on your exam. Some of you may have written some things already, some of you haven't started. But tomorrow morning in class, I will collect these. Make sure if you want something to use in class, you write whatever you want to write on it. Any questions? Did anybody not get one? Oh. All right, guys. Before we end today, I need to um, tell you guys about something because this is kind of lost in a lot of your classes. Brutus was right about large republics and small republics in terms of which one is able to make policy better. He thinks that it's smaller republics are able to crank out policies. You should know that today, that's true. Every year, the United States Congress doesn't pass a lot of laws. And every year, state governments are the ones that pass thousands and thousands of laws in the United States today. Listen carefully, guys. This might be on your exam. The unfortunate thing is, a lot of you I myself was like this when I was growing up. I was politically active, but I was mostly concerned about what the U.S. government is doing, and I'm not really concerned about what this, my state government is doing. When in reality, a lot of the decisions that are being made are being made at the state level, not the national level. Like, for example, those of you who are concerned about abortion, whether or not you like what the Supreme Court decided or not, well, we have no choice anymore. The only people that can decide uh, abortion issues today the state governments. So if you want abortion to change, that policy, if you want to have an impact on abortion, you have to influence your state government. But you have to admit to yourself, you probably don't know who represents you in Austin. You probably don't know who your state senators and your state house of representative members are in the Texas government. I bet you if you ask your parents, they probably don't know either. Because again, people are so preoccupied with the national government, when in reality, state governments are the ones that make most of the decisions here in the United States. Because Brutus is right. The national government is so bogged down by arguing and clashing with opinions that they don't make a lot of policy. It's the state governments that make a lot of the policies in the United States. If you've been near a television recently, you've learned exactly one thing. The midterm elections are upon us. Two days to go before the midterm elections, all eyes are on them. The big question.